questions. We will have time for Q and A. Um, we'll have time for Q and A in the end, and we will have the recording paused so that we can have an open conversation and um, uh, that piece will be kept uh, confidential. So um, today we're gonna be talking about pronouns and beyond, um, inclusive language for everybody. Um, this is uh, included as part of the OBGYN DEI week seminar. Um, so uh, on the next slide, you will see um, Mari and I love photos of ourselves. So even though we're here in the room, we just wanted to add some photos that we love. So you know, and are extra clear um, who we are, we're your co-presenters, as well as our contact information if you wanna follow up with anything. So we'll go ahead and um, before we dive in, just talk about the, the ground rules for this conversation in space. So we really want it to be both polite and a productive discussion. So first ground rule is that we want everyone to treat each other with respect and we can model that both in the discussion and how we um, do the chat and interactions with each other. Um, also uh, one diva, one mic rule. Um, so please don't interrupt others. And we typically use there are no wrong answers in our discussions with community. For this, we'll say we'll adapt it. There are no wrong questions. So don't be afraid of asking too many questions. Much of today will be learning and brainstorming ideas and discussion. And lastly, we want to disagree with ideas, not with people. So let's practice calling each other in if, say, we have different opinions, um, but really, you know, not having it be based off of personal, but not on the people, more about the ideas that maybe we want to discuss and dialogue further on. So a bulk of the conversation today is going to be talking about um, proper use of pronouns and then moving into gender inclusive language. So just to start with the foundations of what pronouns are that, you know, essentially we could think about pronouns in three different ways that um, pronouns can be used in place of a noun. We can refer to ourselves, to other people, places or things. So the examples on screen for a noun, John is here um, or personal pronouns. For example, I spoke to him on the phone yesterday. He is ready to enroll in the program or possessive pronouns. So for example, this is his iPad. Also, as we're going through foundations, we wanted to talk about kind of three distinct areas and wanted to make sure it's very clear what the difference are when we talk about sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, and sex characteristics. So first, sexual orientation. This refers to how a person defines their sexual attraction towards another person. So a person can have a sexual orientation to the same gender, to other genders, or not experience sexual or romantic attraction. Gender identity and expression refers to each person's internal and individual experience of gender when it comes to identity, the internal piece. The expression, gender expression, is how someone publicly presents their gender. So that could come across in terms of clothes, mannerisms, um, makeup, styling, things of that nature. And lastly, sex characteristic. Those are the physical characteristics such as reproductive anatomy and organs and hormonal patterns. Sex characteristics may not conform to those typical that uh, is commonly used language, male or female bodies. We'll get more into suggestions on terms that are more inclusive to use outside of quote unquote male or quote unquote female bodies. So now that we've talked about these three core um, components, we will get dive into each of those areas as we go into the training, but wanted to just level set, provide some foundation. We're gonna talk more about pronouns in general. So we kind of see there are three different types of categories or currently buckets when it comes to thinking about pronouns. So feminine pronouns commonly are she, her, and hers. Gender neutral pronouns are commonly they, them, and theirs. And masculine pronouns, which can commonly be considered as he, him, and his. But it's important to note that pronouns are not the same as gender identity. Just because someone uses he, him pronouns doesn't mean that he identifies as a man. 
So we want to talk a little bit more about gender neutral pronouns, because often I know for many, um, they might be somewhat new, or maybe it's something that you haven't had experience, you know, utilizing or using in daily um, language or daily interactions. So when we're thinking about someone who uses they, them, their pronouns, here's examples of how you would use those pronouns in a sentence when referring to say a colleague or interactions with say a patient. So let's use the example of a colleague, Zalia, who uses they, them pronouns. The way that you can refer to Zalia would be Zalia as a research coordinator. They recruit participants for all of us in the waiting room. Another example would be Tommy. So you can refer to Tommy. Tommy is coming in the office today. I can't wait to work with them. So outside of the, I would say, more kind of mainstream um, pronouns that we mentioned with uh, more commonly seen in terms of masculine, gender neutral, and feminine, there are also neo pronouns. And so those personal um, pronouns um, that we can think about some examples, and there are many more that we see on screen, but just to give examples that there are individuals that also utilize different language when it comes to using their pronouns, and that it's really important to respect those and also to make sure to not assume what the pronouns are that people use. So we could just go over the first example, Z, Zir, Zirs. So say, for example, you have a colleague named Anand who uses the pronouns, you can say, I can't find Anand. Where did Z go? So it's also important to note that using gender neutral or neo pronouns doesn't necessarily indicate that a person identifies as non-binary. Um, so again, if it's, if it's something that's necessary to the work to know, it's always important to ask, to clarify, uh, and to not make exceptions. And I know we'll be going through, you know, we'll have, as I mentioned earlier, we'll have time at the end for Q&A. But if you have questions that come up throughout the presentation, feel free in real time to type in the chat. Myself and Mari will be monitoring the chat and making sure that we surface back to those, re return back to those as we get to the Q&A portion. So we also wanted to share and make sure to um, um, uh, emphasize that there's also individuals who use multiple sets of pronouns and also no pronouns. So we'll first start with the, the example of using multiple uh, sets of pronouns. Um, so say, for example, you have a colleague that uses both she, he, and they pronouns, and they request that people use them all and mix them up. This is an example of how someone would, would do that in practice. So Donna works at the community center. She is based in Chicago. This year, he has success successfully organized many events for the LGBTQ community inclusion in all of us. They are skilled at community engagement techniques. Um, so if individuals are sharing that they have multiple sets of pronouns, it's important to also recognize and also to honor that as well in the interactions. There's also individuals that don't use pronouns and instead use their name to refer to themselves. So an example of how you might use that in, in uh, interactions or talking about an individual, we could talk about an individual, Jamar, who only uses their name Jamar to refer to themselves, so no pronouns. So an example to refer to Jamar, you can say, Jamar is a great chef. Jamar is writing a cookbook. That is Jamar's notebook of recipes over there. And as we're talking about all the you know different ways that pronouns are used, different um, pronouns that individuals use, and understanding the wide diversity when it comes to this, is I think also important to think about what's the importance of using correct pronouns. Um, I think, you know, hopefully we all can um, uh, maybe make the assumption that we're all here because we have positive intentions. We want to use correct pronouns for individuals. We want to be able to honor and respect folks. Um, so a way to do that is using correct pronouns, because that then is a sign of respect. Um, and using incorrect pronouns can be hurtful for individuals. And that also includes assuming pronouns. Um, so for example, if wrong pronouns are used, 
especially for sexual and gender minority people, it's really important to consider what that impact is, even if you had positive intent, um, that it could often be the first interaction. So think about patient um, serving interactions. Say if you had best intentions and you welcome someone and you said, greetings, sir, um, how can I help you? And that person is does not identify as a sir. And that's their first interaction that they have with the clinic. That could be something that you know is harmful for them and unfortunately could potentially color their interactions with, with, with the entire experience um, with the clinic or um, with the team. So it's important to think about what that impact is in addition to um, what the intent is. And again, just underscoring, um, it's, always, um, it's always important to ask if there's a business need and if there is a, you know, if it's essential for the interaction. So people may use different pronouns in different settings and with different groups of people. So, you know, just considering that as well, say if you're with someone in a social setting and if they're using different pronouns, you know, just to keep aware of that as well. The last note is just something that we wanted to call attention to is that um, really, you know, uh, I know, uh, 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 again, this is like uh, thinking about the impact and intent. Um, it's best practice is to not refer to them as preferred pronouns. Preferred kind of gives the assumption that and the, the uh, insinuation that it's a preference. It's something that, you know, is, is merely just a preference rather than something that should be respected and honored. So instead, you could use the term just simply use pronouns or you could use personal pronouns. And so um, I'm going to take a break from talking for so much, and I'm going to um, just to incorporate some other voices. We have a video that shares about um, why respecting pronouns is important. I use they and them as my pronouns, and when someone uses they and them as my pronouns, I feel like that person is listening to me, that person cares about me, and that person wants to have a conversation with me. Pronouns are a fascinating part of modern culture. I don't think many people think about them very often until someone like myself or others say their pronouns. So when I introduce myself, I generally say, hi, my name's Sam Britton. I use they and them as my pronouns, and I serve as head of advocacy and government affairs for the Trevor Project. I give this before I even give my job because it's the important way that you're going to describe me. Not what I do, but who I am. And that I respect for my gender is really, really important. I think our culture has built itself around an idea that the faster I can learn something about you, the faster I can um, interact with you. We are a system of speed. And pronouns sometimes slow that down, right? Like, the assumption uh, makes things easier. We are, every single time we meet someone, immediately putting some type of um, judgment on them really quickly so we know how to interact with them. But that judgment could be wrong. And so I think the hard part is to change perspective. Now, this isn't asking you to run a marathon. This is you saying that you want to be respected in a specific way, and I can do that for you by using a pronoun. Things that companies and schools can do are on the first day of classes, and for maybe the first week, having a sticker where you tell people, hi, my name is Sam, my pronouns are they and them. It's also really important to recognize that pronouns change sometimes. Many of us uh, will not always have the same pronouns uh, because our gender is changing or our gender realization has changed. I think that's really, really important for us to say that the flexibility of your personality should be something that we can respect and the flexibility of your gender identity is something that we can respect. Pronouns are confusing. 
I'm not going to say that they're not. But if I can have the President of the United States use my gender neutral pronouns, and I can respectfully use theirs, then I think we're going to be in a world where everyone can be respected and everyone has the responsibility to be respectful. I use the Thanks so much. So again, you know, wanted to just highlight from a personal perspective, hearing about the importance and what it means when it comes to using um, pronouns and respecting folks as pronouns. So we're gonna give a, just a few examples of ways that everyone can share pronouns. And this is really for everybody. It's not, I think if we normalize these practices more, it will just benefit everyone involved. And in particular, takes the burden off of feeling like, I, I know often folks who are part of trans, gender minority communities often feel like it's sometimes um, isolating or it could feel targeting if you're only asking or only having individuals who um, are not within the gender binary sharing pronouns. So if it's a practice that we can normalize in both professional and social situations, it just benefits everybody. So here's some examples of ways that you could do it. So sharing pronouns and introductions. So for example, um, say you're uh, having an interaction with someone, you can say, hi, my name is Sheila. My pronouns are they, them. I'm glad you made it here today. So another way that you can do this is think about, um, you know, in a workplace setting, and I've seen actually the uh, wonderful um, placards that we have, or not the placards, but the badge attachments that we have for pronouns. So you can consider that if you wanna wear those, so pronoun badges, and also if there's pronoun buttons. Um, you can ignore the bottom. Um, we've done this training also for our colleagues at the All of Us Research Program. So another way is consider um, including your pronouns in your email signature. Um, so that's another way that helps to normalize the practice and share pronouns with those that maybe you're having interactions with digitally and um, wanna make sure that you are respecting their pronouns and sh proactively sharing yours as well. And you can also consider including pronouns in online platform profiles. So for example, I could see many folks here that have um, on their Zoom profile in parentheses um, what their pronouns are. Again, these are all invitations. Um, no one should feel that they should be forced to do anything that they're not comfortable with or not wanting to you know, um, disclose pronouns in certain situations. These are just some models and examples of ways that you can proactively do it if you so choose. And I'll go ahead and hand it over to Mari to share more about the next slides. And I think you're on mute, Mari. Yeah, so just to... <laughs> so thank you, Daniel. So we talked about just ways that we can be proactive and sharing our pronouns and modeling that behavior for other people. But sometimes we don't always have name badges and things like that. And we do, um, you know, um, sometimes make assumptions and that can go wrong. And sometimes these are based on the way people, uh, you might hear someone's name, uh, how, they're, how they dress, their hairstyle, their mannerisms, which are all aspects of uh, someone's gender expression, which we discussed earlier. And making assumptions based on someone's gender expression can really result in you using the wrong pronouns because really gender identity is something that is internal. And along with someone's gender expression, it may change over time, which we also saw in the video. And um, when we don't know someone else's pronouns, we can really avoid mistakes and negative interactions by avoiding gendered language. So uh, not saying Mr. and Mrs. or Sir and Ma'am, which, you know, I'm raised in the South. I'm originally from Kentucky. I mean, that's just the respectful way that you're supposed to address people, but it is uh, it is gendered and it does kind of establish a binary that isn't necessary. Now, also not saying ladies, guys, gentlemen, and using gender, gender neutral language such as team, colleagues, people, friends, folks. And then again, if you don't know some friends, you can just share your pronouns and maybe they can share theirs 
with you. Sometimes people don't understand that, but when you model sharing pronouns, you might actually uh, be able to avoid making assumptions. But as we know, mistakes do happen. And so when you do use the wrong pronouns for someone, just apologize, use the correct pronoun, and you really don't have to explain why you use the wrong pronoun or really dwell on the apology. So um, just continuing along with your interaction and what you're doing and minimizing that, again, like Daniel spoke about before, think about the impact rather than the intent uh, and just, uh, just correct yourself and move on. So in this example scenario, we see the person is saying like, hi, Sherry, this is Christopher. He's here today to get some all of us swag. And uh, the participant replies, hey, I actually use they, them pronouns. And so you can say, I'm so sorry, Christopher. Sherry, do you mind bringing them an iPad so we can get started? Again, you don't have to go into why you said it or anything like that. Just correct yourself and move on with the interaction. Sometimes we actually hear other people use the wrong pronouns for someone. And um, again, depending on your setting or whatever, it might be difficult to uh, remind the person of the pronouns. We've given an example here, but of course, you know, use your own judgment on how to proceed. But that is a, also a very important welcoming step to let someone know that uh, someone there is going to be, you know, an advocate for them. So if you hear someone else using the wrong pronoun, such as this, in this example, if your colleague says, hey, Marnie, you missed Jay yesterday. She came in to provide some bio samples. And you say back to them, oh, well, sorry, I missed him. Jay uses he, him pronouns. I hope I'm here when he comes next time. And your colleague might say, oh my gosh, that's right. Thank you. Thanks for reminding me. He's coming next. He's coming to the next Lunch and Learn next week. Maybe you'll get to see him. So again, it doesn't have, to, you don't have to make a big scene about it. It's just use the correct pronouns and then move on with that interaction and remind, reminding people of that. So we have a couple take home points uh, just from the pronoun section before we get into the beyond that we're gonna talk about later. But just remembering uh, as we started out that pronouns are a part of language. They're a normal part of language. We use pronouns every day to describe ourselves, uh, whether they're personal pronouns, possessive pronouns, they're just words that stand in the place of a noun. Using the wrong pronouns and assuming a person's gender can be harmful. So also remembering to use non-gendered language when necessary when necessary is going to, again, establish that welcoming environment and presence. Sharing your own pronouns online and, inter and in introductions uh, can make it easier for others to share their pronouns. When you make mistakes, just apologize quickly, correct yourself uh, and move on. And you can build your confidence by practicing interactions and learning more about sexual and gender minority people, which you're doing by being here today. Um, yeah, even if you just kind of read over these scenarios again, you may not have found yourself in one of these situations yet, but if you remember back to that, it might help you uh, in the next time. So we have a quick video. This video talks about children, but we're sharing it here because it's showing how early um, using gendered language can uh, establish these pa patterns of bias and stereotypes before we get into talking more about other ways we can use inclusive language. Hey friends, it's not uncommon for children's activities to be advertised as being for boys and girls or to hear a teacher shout, okay, boys and girls, line up. Using binary gender to categorize kids isn't harmless and can actually contribute to sexist attitudes and feelings of exclusion among children. I'm Dr. Kyle, and I'm sharing three reasons for expanding beyond boys and girls by using gender neutral and inclusive terms. Reason number one. The phrase boys and girls signifies gender as a binary and exceptional point of difference among kids. 
When children are made to think of themselves according to which group they belong to, such as race or class or gender, they're more likely to develop bias against children who are not in their group. Research shows that when teachers use gendered language and categories to organize their classrooms, young students show more gender stereotyping and rejection of different gender peers compared to students in classrooms where gender isn't an explicit category. Replacing the phrase boys and girls with a term like friends or learners can help children avoid developing sexist attitudes and increase the likelihood that they'll play in mixed gender groups. That's a good thing. Reason number two. Many children don't identify with the gender they were assigned at birth, and hearing the phrase boys and girls can make some children feel invisible and like they don't belong. There are transgender, non-binary, and gender-fluid kids, and intersex children, and the call to line up in the boy line or the girl line can feel distressing. For example, a transgender girl may feel uncomfortable choosing the girl line if her teacher or her classmates aren't aware of her transition yet and may say something to her, like, you're in the wrong line. Children thrive in environments where they feel seen, loved, and supported. Grown-ups can choose language and behavior that holds affirming space for kids who are between and beyond the gender binary. If forming lines is absolutely necessary, get creative. January through June birthdays here and July through December birthdays here. Reason number three. Language is a powerful force, and children learn about the world through the words they are taught. Gendered language can influence gender bias about who does what. More often than not, boys and men get preferential treatment and power in the English language. Mankind, gingerbread man, mixed gender groups addressed as guys, firemen, mailman, congressmen, Girls and non-binary people don't get as much representation in language, which implies they aren't as important. Studies have found that the use of gender-neutral language reduces gender bias and leads to more favorable attitudes towards cisgender women and queer and transgender people. Ousting boys and girls and the grown-up equivalent ladies and gentlemen from your vocabulary is an easy way to commit to everyday anti-sexist action and celebrate gender diversity. Here's a few replacements to get you started. Kiddos, scholars, buddies, esteemed guests, vessels of stardust, little cuties, crew, folks, athletes, innovators, artists, adventurers. I'd love it if you'd like this video and share it with so we'll pause there. Um, and as we go into the next section, we are going to talk more about representation in language, which uh, the uh, host of that video mentioned. And also, again, it may arise some feelings. We will talk about some themes of being erased, et cetera, which you'll see in some of the videos that we we'll watch. But I just wanted to frame the next section about um, so I'll frame it with a little bit of a story of like why we even, because um, as Daniel mentioned, we've used these trainings for other purposes and we've combined them into this. Uh, we have recently have been over the past two years working with an, an organization called Interact Advocates for Intersex Youth. Uh, basically, uh, we did some listening sessions with people in the intersex community. And then also uh, after that, we worked on a training about being strategies for welcoming and including intersex people uh, in, in research. And what really came up for me, and I'm just gonna talk about my own personal journey here is so long, I just always talking about sexual orientation and gender identity and not really talking about sex characteristics. And that's something that um, is very important to intersex people and it's gonna help intersex people feel included, but it actually helps everyone. So I just wanted to frame uh, that before we move into the next couple of slides. So this is just more ways to be inclusive in the ways that we talk about bodies and bodily functions and anatomy. Hey. So inclusive language makes people feel seen. Again, it's not about erasing categories of people, but we wanna acknowledge that many people who are assigned female at birth or maybe uh, or assigned, maybe just don't identify with 
the sex they were assigned at birth can feel excluded by some of the cis women centric language around pregnancy. Uh, so it's saying mothers versus fathers. Uh, pregnant women can be cis women centric. So it's more gender inclusive to say pregnant people or pregnant women and pregnant people, which doesn't necessarily erase or exclude anybody. And instead of saying mothers, saying birthing parents or mothers and birthing parents. And there's many, many other terms, again, as we'll stress through this whole training is like asking people and re reflecting that language and uh, your materials that you kind of have in your practice or your um, day to day interactions with people is really what's going to uh, foster those feelings of inclusion. And again, some of the things that we learn in working with our partners at Interact is that uh, when we talk about sex characteristics, a lot of people really still are using gendered language that just is not necessary. So instead of saying female or male chromosomes, we can say XX or XY chromosomes. Similarly, instead of talking about female or male genitalia, we can actually refer to organs and body parts by their names. So saying vagina, or penis, and, and instead of saying biological sex or biological gender, uh, being more inclusive, again, especially of intersex people, are you talking about sex traits or sex characteristics when that's actually what we're talking about. If we are talking about someone's sex assigned at birth, of course, then we're talking about sex assigned at birth. But if we're talking about sex characteristics or sex traits, let's actually use those words. And another important thing that we learned in working with Interact and, and, and working on this training together is just even the ways we talk about body types can be reframed in a more inclusive way. So thinking of an XX pathway or an XY pathway that someone might experience. And especially when we talk about primary sex characteristics, again, just talking about the actual, using the name of the actual uh, organ or a part of anatomy. And when we're talking about secondary sex characteristics, uh, uh, an important thing is not saying male puberty or female puberty, actually just talking about the sex traits as they are and referring to it maybe as testosterone puberty or estrogen puberty. Because again, when we talk about uh, intersex people, an intersex person can be assigned female at birth, identify as a woman uh, and have uh, be attracted to men, but they may have variations in sex characteristics. So we um, need to, again, think beyond just sexual orientation, gender identity, and just uh, intersex people don't often don't feel like they fit neatly within those categories. And so again, Talking this way about bodies really helps everybody. It's not just for intersex people, but if we keep this in mind, we will be inclusive for everyone. And again, as we mentioned before, it's always important to ask, uh, as you know, at the prize study, we are, people can fill in the blanks in our surveys. We, anytime we ask questions like that, we give people the opportunity to say, uh, to use their own terminology. And again, in your, other interactions that when you have with people, when it's appropriate, I think uh, what we've had people talk about is like, you know, if you're going to the dentist, I, it might seem weird to ask about organs that aren't important to that interaction. But if it is appropriate and necessary to your interaction, you should definitely just ask how people refer to their body and their sex traits and not make any assumptions. So before we get into our Q&A and discussions, we wanted to just uh, watch this video, which is, you know, we're here in OBGYN. This is actually a video with a perspective and a story that we felt was important from an actual uh, OBGYN provider. And I'll go ahead and play this and uh, we have a few take home points and then we can just start some discussion. Welcome back, everyone. My name is Dr. Jennifer Lincoln. I'm an OBGYN, and I am here today to talk about why it is important to be inclusive and what that even means. And to be honest, I had a totally different YouTube plan today, but after a post of mine 
that I put on Instagram this week got some interesting feedback. I thought, you know what? Let's talk about this today. This is more important than the other stuff can wait. I'm outside today because it's beautiful and it's gonna be about 90 degrees later today. So instead of filming in my basement where it's really cold and dark, I thought I'd come out here and enjoy it. So hopefully we will not have too many interruptions by cars, lawnmowers, all that kind of stuff. Now, am I an expert on inclusive care and that kind of thing? No, I'm not. And maybe I'll even get some things wrong here. Just like with racism, I do not consider myself an expert, but we should not wait until we're experts on racism to start anti-racist work. I feel like we've learned that in the past year. This is the same thing. So putting yourself out there, you might get something wrong. You might say something wrong. You might use a term that's like, ooh, that's not ideal. Guess what? I've done that too. And people have given me feedback and I've said, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. Thank you for teaching me. I'm gonna work to do better. And I'm gonna keep teaching myself. Maybe even here I've used words or definitions or things that you don't think I, you know, were the best. Go ahead and let me know. This is how we learn. But what I wanna highlight is that if we wait to be an expert in these sorts of things, then we're never going to take the steps in learning and doing better. Here's the post that I posted today, how to be a more inclusive OBGYN and why it matters. And so I wanna share my story with you. First of all, what does it mean to be inclusive? Being inclusive means that we don't refer to all pregnant people as pregnant women or pregnant moms. Instead, we wanna include everyone. So we might say birthing people, birthing person, pregnant person. Instead of saying all women who have periods, we might say all people who have periods or people who have a uterus and have a period. And when you hear that the first few times, you might think, this is ridiculous. This using all these words, just say woman, just say pregnant mom, just say dad. When you use this language, you're erasing motherhood and fatherhood. And I'm here today to tell you that that's not the case and to give you some quick information on why that's so, why we need to be like this and how to get there. So first I wanna tell you my story. And I feel like it's okay to share that when we know better, we do better. So a few years ago, I was at a conference and I had heard that there was a journal that was saying, you, you know, we should not refer to all pregnant women as mothers. And the person who was telling me this was really upset and said, they're trying to erase motherhood. And I thought, wow, she's right. Like, I'm a mom. And why are we taking this away from other mothers, this term that means so much? And I didn't quite understand what it meant. And I came to it when honestly I was on social media more and I saw other people on social media and I started to see this language being used and to see that it didn't take away mothers or take away our you know heteronormative roles but instead it broadened the definition to include people so what I'm talking about is using language that is more inclusive that allows more people to be in the group instead of less people and the people who are already in the group don't lose their status or not as important it just means that we're adding to it because not everybody fits the definitions of what we as society have traditionally called a mother or a father or a woman or a man. Sex and gender are very different things and, and this is just the fact. It's not some crazy interpretation or some crazy left-wing liberal idea. It's true. <laughs> so, so that's how I came to it. So I realized that over time and even in just the past year or so, my posts have attempted to be more inclusive in terms of language. And so I like to go back and forth. I like to say women and people with periods or birthing women and birthing people and go back and forth because I think that that helps to move the needle and it also helps people see that you can be, you can include everybody and everybody feels seen, if that makes sense. So if you're saying, why does this matter? Because it's just a small group of people and you know, I'm sorry, but only women give birth. Well, that's not really true. So here's why it matters. So we know that 150,000 kids and 1.4 million adults live in the United States and identify as transgender. So if you ask me, that's good enough reason for me. And quite frankly, I don't care if me using inclusive language helps one or, there we go. Now we dance. <laughs> that's what happens when you film outside. So what was I saying? Oh, it doesn't matter if, you know, I'm helping five people feel more included, but when you're talking about hundreds of thousands and millions of people who identify in a different way than what we as society have traditionally labeled male and female, then why wouldn't we want to include them? Because guess what? They matter too. I'm not transgender and I'm a cis female and I don't feel threatened when I use that kind of language, but guess who does feel threatened and ignored and not seen when we use exclusionary, exclusionary language? The people I just spoke about. 
And these aren't just hypothetical norms. We have studies and data, and you know me, I've always got my references and resources down in the show notes. We know in one study, 30% of transgendered respondents had had at least one negative experience at the doctor's office, whether they weren't understood, the doctor asked them to teach them about trans care and pronouns and that kind of thing, or they were refused care or verbally harassed. That's terrible at a doctor's office, which should be a safe space for everybody. 23% of transgendered individuals have not gone to a doctor because they have been afraid to interact with their healthcare provider or have been afraid to be subject to that prejudice and that discriminatory treatment. What do you think happens when these people don't go to the doctor? Things get missed, people end up sicker. The level of care that somebody gets should not be dependent on their sexual orientation or their gender identity. Here's what's important and here's why I think this is important. Being inclusive hurts no one and excludes no one. So when we use inclusive language, we are not excluding women or saying that women aren't important or that traditional cis relationships, male, female, husband, wife, whatever, are not important if that's what's important to you. It just means that we've broadened the definition. We've invited more people to the party instead of making it an invite only and we've excluded a bunch of people. So why wouldn't we do that? And why as healthcare providers, we took an oath to first do no harm if I do harm by using a term that does not, is not how you identify at your core being, that's not okay. So, so um, thank you for uh, watching that and uh, listening really to this personal journey. Daniel and I wanted to include this video and we were hoping we had enough time, which we did, <laughs> to show as much of this uh, physician's journey as possible because we know like a lot of people are going through this journey. I mean, we live right now in a very p- political moment where just the, the there's a lot of uh, things going on politically uh, that around pregnancy and abortion <laughs> access, et cetera, where um, just the whole idea of wokeness, like just making sure people feel included is going to like be inflammatory and excite a lot of incite sorry a lot of people again you saw the comments that people were uh that uh, she had posted in her video about just the reaction that she was getting from using that language but again uh we really appreciated her journey and some of the things that she said about uh how being inclusive really hurts no one but it does build that bigger tent and just remind people that you don't lose your status when you include other people and the consequences of not including people is that people don't seek health care or they uh, delay health care till, till, uh, till it's too late. Hey. So some of the takeaways just from this section is just uh, gender binary, gendered, sorry, binary language helps develop bias and stereotypes. We saw how starting early just being kids and everything is boys and girls and and things like this and boys in this section and girls in this section just starts that process of uh, bias and stereotypes and then really using inclusive language uh, and including everybody in kind of the terminology that we use doesn't really have to exclude anyone. Uh, Learn along the way, just get started and ask and seek input. It's really, uh, we think, really easy to do and we're definitely here to help you here at PrideNet. Uh, you can contact any of us for assistance. And uh, we have some time left, about a little bit over 25 minutes or so, to uh, just help people process thoughts, feelings, answer questions, etc. Thanks so much, Mom.